you for your patience for being here. What we're going to do this morning uh, is uh, first, uh, Dr. McNutt is the chief of uh, trauma surgery here in, uh, in this institution that, like we said yesterday, we're very blessed in the city of Houston that we have uh, medical facilities that are second to none. And, uh, uh, and I believe that many people that in other places may not survive, survive because of the excellence of this hospital. Dr. McNutt will uh, give you a medical update. Uh, understand that the HIPAA rules have to be followed and other rules, so uh, she will not be answering questions once she makes her statement. And then we'll go ahead and go through the incident and update the media on suspects and, uh, and uh, additional information we have today. So thanks, Dr. McNutt, for being here this morning. Thank Appreciate you. My pleasure. Everybody, thank you for being here today. Um, as you all know, there were five Houston police officers injured in the line of duty who were taken to the Red Beach Trauma Institute Memorial Clinic yesterday. Uh, due to patient privacy and family wishes, uh, I will only be updating on three of their conditions. Uh, first of all, all three officers are currently stable. They're clinically stable in our hospital. Uh, one gentleman suffered a gunshot wound to the face, was taken to the operating room last night, uh, is currently recovering and will undergo multiple other operations by our facial trauma team in the future. Uh, but again, he is stable right now. Uh, another officer also sustained a gunshot wound to the face. Fortunately, he will not require surgery and will most likely be discharged home later today. He's doing well. Uh, and finally, the third officer um, also sustained a knee injury during the altercation. He has already undergone surgery by our orthopedic trauma team. He's also recovering and will most likely be sent home later this week. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our first responders, including the Houston uh, Fire Department, who was um, available on scene, quickly assessed, treated, and, and transported the patient to, uh, to our hospital. Uh, I also want to take this time to thank Memorial Herman Life Flight uh, and also all of the physicians, nurses, and techs in the ER in the operating room who did their job fantastic yesterday. Um, each step in trauma is critical. Time is of the essence. Time is extremely important, not only in the pre-hospital setting, but also once you arrive to the hospital. And I'm very proud of our team for doing their job yesterday. Uh, Memorial Herman Hospital is here for the men and women who serve our community. Uh, we are also honored to take care of our police officers and our community and are always ready to help you if you're injured. <coughs> again, uh, Dr. McNutt, again, on, on behalf of all of our officers, not just for yesterday, but what, for what you do, not just for our officers, but this community, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. We used to work heroes all the time, but uh, the doctors and nurses of this institution, the firefighters, everyone that was involved, the life flight, just, uh, they're all heroes in our eyes, and uh, we, we're just very blessed. So again, thank you, and thank you for being here this morning. And so again, I want to update everyone uh, on some of the uh, information that, that you may or may not have. Uh, but let me just say that the involved officers are all undercover narcotics officers because of security concerns and some other issues and ongoing investigations. We will not be releasing names at this point, at this time, but you know, we're very much, uh, uh, Commander Fallis, come up here. Uh, we're all uh, believe in transparency and when we can, we'll release more information. So I will be releasing today the names, of, uh, not the names of the officers, but uh, their age, not years of service, just to give you a flavor for the type of individuals that we have. As you know, yesterday, uh, about 4.30, shortly before 5 o'clock, uh, narcotics officers from the Houston Police Department from the uh, uh, Group uh, 15 uh, initiated a search warrant uh, at the location at uh, the same <coughs> block of uh, Harding Street. Uh, upon making entry, uh, they uh, immediately came under fire. The first officer through the door, armed with a shotgun, uh, was charged immediately by a very large pit bull that charged at that officer. He discharged. Uh, rounds that we know that the, the dog was struck and uh, killed. Uh, at the same time, a, a male suspect came from around uh, the back and started an open fire with a uh, 357 Magnum revolver. That officer was struck in the shoulder. He went down, uh, fell on the sofa in the living room, at which time a female suspect went towards that officer reached over the officer and started making a move for his shotgun. Uh, at that time, uh, backup officers, other officers in the staff that made entry, uh, 
discharge their firearm, striking this, that female suspect. Uh, an exchange of gunfire occurred, continued, uh, between that officer who struck. The first uh, op uh, the officer that I described yesterday that's 54 years of age, this is the third time in his career he's been shot. And this guy is 54, and here he is, not retired, but actually being the case agent. That officer is actually the officer that breached the door, and when you breach the door, you don't make entry, your other officers make entry. He immediately knew that he had his partners were down, and he made entry. Uh, when he made entry, he himself uh, got shot. Uh, after we had two officers down and another one shot, the remaining officers in the stack started laying down cover fire, left positions of cover themselves, and they all, uh, I believe, heroically pulled their fellow officers uh, out of harm's way, and then we all know what happened between Life Flight, uh, EMS, and uh, Houston Police, where we escorted everybody here either by ambulance or by helicopter. The injured officers, uh, the officer that was uh, shot in the face, again, uh, that will hopefully will be released uh, sometime today or tomorrow, sometime this week, is a 50-year-old sergeant and a 25-year veteran of the Houston Police Department. Uh, another officer uh, that was uh, that sustained the injury to his knee that actually required surgery and has been completed and will probably get out this week is a 50-year sergeant and a 50-year-old sergeant and a 27-year-old a 27-year veteran. The officer that I described, senior officer I described is 54 years old and a 32-year veteran and the case agent is the one that after he saw his fellow officers uh, come under fire, he really made that entry and uh, I'm just gonna say it, he just uh, passed a note to one of us, uh, one of our officers that said, I had to get in there uh, because I knew my guys were down. And that just speaks values as to what uh, this man is. Just his courage under fire. And the other, another officer was a 33-year-old officer, 10-year veteran, and he he sustained again uh, a shoulder wound, and he was released yesterday. But he did he sustain a shoulder wound from the gunfire. The last officer that was struck, you all know that we talked about him yesterday. But the family has asked that we not talk about further about his medical condition. But I will say this. He's in the fight, he's in a fight, he's stable, but we need to pray for all these officers, especially uh, the last officer. Uh, we just need the community's prayers for him and his family and for all these officers, including the ones that weren't shot. If you can imagine the guilt that gets in, the, the what ifs, the second guessing, why was it me, all those things. So all these officers need prayers. Now, the investigation is ongoing as to the officers that I mentioned that have been shot in terms of which ones, uh, we haven't been able to debrief them, so we can't tell you which one of them at this point, uh, specifically who returned fire. But I can tell you that the officers that affected the rescue and returned fire that were part of the initial stack. There was nine officers in that stack. One is a 30-year veteran, uh, a 30-year-old uh, officer with, and a nine-year veteran. The second officer, and these guys were newer on the team, so they were back in the stack is a 32-year-old officer and a 10-year veteran. Another officer is a 37-year-old officer and an 8-year veteran. And the last officer to discharge that we have determined so far is a 36-year-old officer and 11-year veteran. Uh, we do not have cameras on us when we make these entries. There were no cameras, no body-worn cameras. So uh, if anyone's asking, uh, is wondering about that, uh, they need to uh, know that we do not have cameras. <clears throat> the officer, this is a 54-year-old officer, 32-year veteran, it's, uh, this is his third time being shot. He was shot in the line of duty in 1992 and again in 1997. We have identified our suspects, and our suspects uh, uh, next of kin has been, has, have, been, um, have been notified and uh, went to uh, Bobby, can you hold the suspects and can you guys hold the suspect? The, the female suspect that you see there that actually 
uh, was shot in the living room when she went to grab the, uh, the fallen officer shotgun. Uh, is identified, she's a female wife, identified uh, as, and I will spell it out for you, first name, uh, Regina, R-H-O-G-E-N-A, Regina, R-H-O-G-E-N-A, N-A, last name Nicholas, N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S, N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S, she was 50, uh, 58 years of age. The male suspect that actually uh, engaged in the firefight with the officers is, is 59 years of age. He's also a, wh uh, a white male, and uh, he is identified as Dennis, D-E-N-N-I-S, Tuttle, T-U-T-T-L-E, Tuttle, T-U-T-T-L-E. <clears throat> the female one more time, sorry. The female is Regina, R-H-O-G-E-N-A, Last name of Nicholas, N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S, 58-year-old white female. Uh, we're not going to talk about their criminal histories. That's part of the investigation, and uh, we've got a lot uh, to go into their, their background to see uh, what we can learn about that part of our ongoing investigation. A search warrant uh, was conducted last night, uh, and a search of the premises revealed uh, the presence of marijuana in the location. Uh, we also uh, recovered another drug, white powdery substance, uh, believed to either be uh, cocaine or, or potentially uh, fentanyl. We recovered uh, two 12-gauge shotguns, 120 gauge shotgun, 122 caliber rifle, and one Remington uh, 700 rifle. Those are the items that were recovered in the target location. Uh, the investigation into uh, that location will continue, and the investigation of the officer involved shooting will continue uh, with the assistance of the Harris County District Attorney's Office. Obviously, our Special Investigations Unit, which is our specialized unit that conducts uh, investigations to officer involved units, and lastly, the Internal Affairs Unit that will conduct uh, an, uh, an administrative review into everything from A to Z, uh, tactical plans, everything that went into this operation to ensure that all departmental policies were adhered to. All the officers that, been, that uh, were involved in the officer involved shooting will be placed on administrative leave consistent with the departmental policy. Uh, they've all been debriefed. We've, uh, we've had psychological teams. We had three of our psychologists here yesterday. Our peer support folks were here yesterday. And our peer support and psychological services will also be debriefing families members of our involved employees or any, any of our employees that need it, uh, our dispatchers and the, just the rest of our team. And so with that, I think I've covered everything I need to cover, uh, and I will open it, open it up for questions from, from anyone. Chief, who is the officer that was discharged already? Which one was he? Are you serious? Can I already tell you guys that? Let me get my, back, my, 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 uh, my little cheaters back on. Uh, he was the one that's already discharged. Uh, was a 33-year-old tenure of veteran, and uh, he was discharged uh, yesterday. And he actually did sustain a gunshot wound to the shoulder. Chief, you mentioned this uh, officer that was shot three times in one day. Undercover officers, how dangerous is this line? Well, police work is two things that you could you know about <coughs> police work. It, it could be tremendously boring. 90. 8% of the time, and extremely dangerous and dynamic 2% of the time. But we know that they're always in danger, and it's, it, it, it is, it's dangerous business we're in. We know that, you know, we live in a society where there's a proliferation of firearms, where you can assume there'll be firearms just about every location that you hit. And unfortunately, some people just don't have a respect for the sanctity field life. And so, uh, but what I'll tell you, uh, I, I am going to rub that man for two reasons. One, I want someone who's courage to, to rub off on me, and, uh, and the other thing I want to, uh, he's done something good in life that God really watches over him. And I know you can't identify him, but what can you say about him? Did you know him personally? He's a, he's a, he's a big teddy bear. He's a big uh, African-American, uh, strong ox, uh, tough as nails, and uh, uh, the only thing bigger than his body in terms of his stature is the is his courage. I mean, I don't know. I, I think God had to give him that big, uh, that big body to be able to contain his courage because the man's got some tremendous courage. 
Uh, he went in there, and like I said, he passed it on this morning. I had it going in, I'll get emotional thinking about it. Uh, I had to, I had it going, my guys, I knew my guys were down. So, what else? Chief, were all of the officers that were wounded inside, did, were they, were, were all the wounds sustained inside the home? Yeah, uh, inside, uh, either inside or at the doorway. Uh, so it was very, it was a very uh, tight floor. Unfortunately, when you're going through a door, that's really a, a fatal funnel. Uh, and once you go through the door and you have the first officer that went in with the shotgun go down, our officers don't have a choice. They've got to enter that fatal funnel, go through. The tactical advantage really is in the hands of the suspect. Uh, but uh, that's what they get paid to do. You know your brother's down, your sister's down. Uh, you go in. That's what they did. And we're, we're really proud of it. The suspects knew uh, full well the officers were going to be going in uh, into that house? That's part of the investigation. I, 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 I can't tell you they had a lot of uh, drug houses. And I can tell you this, uh, Chief Dobbins and I were talking about it. The neighborhood uh, thanked our officers because it was a, it was a drug house. It, the, the community, their eyes and ears, and that's how we started. And they said, thank you. Uh, it's been, they, they described it as a problem location. They thanked the officers. But a lot of drug houses uh, have uh, surveillance systems that are better than uh, what we, the businesses use. I mean, you're in an illicit business, and we know that uh, they protect, uh, they want to know when the cops are coming, so that's part of the investigation. Chief, is there anything that's concerning uh, that we're seeing a lot on social media <coughs> because of all the transparency? Yeah, people are thanking you all for taking this seriously and then moving in like you did yesterday. However, a couple of schools are in the area, nice day yesterday, there are parks nearby, less than a quarter mile away. And a lot of parents were asking, is this normal for you all to move in, knowing school buses and all of these things are happening? Can you speak a little to well, that? Well, I can tell you that I, I, I'm not aware of a single school bus or, and I didn't see a single kid in that neighborhood. And I got there, we were actually meeting with the, it's, you know, life's full of ironies. We were actually meeting the new <clears throat> special agent in charge of the DEA in my office at 1200 Travis. When we get the call near five o'clock that we have officers down from uh, Larry Bainbridge, our, our SWAT uh, cap commander, and uh, I got there fast enough that my Tahoe ended up one house from the target house. So if you imagine when five officers are down, how many cops are going to roll? You've been in the business long enough. So I got for me to be able to get to that spot, we got there pretty quickly. I didn't see any children, and I didn't see any school bus, and so. You know, do we always think about doing things better? Absolutely. Uh, but I, I, I can assure you that the officers that are going to do the entry are not going to wait till they see the school bus unloading before they make the entry. I don't, I don't believe there's any evidence or any indication that any uh, child was, uh, was in danger at that time. I can tell you again, I was there very quickly and I didn't see any, any, I didn't see any children. Chief, you talked a little bit about the wounds that were sustained by the officers. Um, can you give us some perspective on were any of the officers shot in their bulletproof vests? No, not, 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 not that we're aware of. And by the way, I'll just say this, you know, everybody has a family and, and, and our condolences goes out to the suspects. I mean, at the end of the day, you, you know, you engage police officers and you start shooting at police officers, they're going to shoot back, but that's somebody's loved one and, you know, we, we send our, our thoughts out to the families. Right? We can't control who our family members are, and we can't control what they do, but, you know, it's a, it's a tragedy when you have a loss of life. There's nothing to celebrate other than we're just very fortunate that uh, we had five officers injured, four shot, and uh, they're all alive. Chief, how much did y'all know, like, going into, like, whether the suspects would be armed or whether they're going to be there, or how much information intelligence you beforehand knowing that, that what will, the situation would be like? Yeah, I mean, look, when you're hitting a drug house, you can almost always make the assumption you're going to have armed suspects. Uh, just yesterday we had our press conference talking about our 2018 end of year crime and one of the things that we told the community earlier yesterday was that the, the three greatest drivers of homicides in any in most big cities including ours are gang, right? Gang, gang affiliation, drugs, and the third one is domestic violence. So uh, you know, we, we try to work up houses as much as possible, but uh, nine, 99 times out of 100, we don't hang out in the house, we haven't been in the house, uh, we just do the best you can. Uh, but that'll be far, part of our administrative review and obviously our uh, SIU review on the tactical plan. Uh, ultimately, when we have anyone shot, 
suspect or officers, we always look at the totality from beginning to end of how we conducted the, the uh, operation to see if there's any lessons learned that we probably review. There's been some chatter among law enforcement officers that there's been a change in operations where there was a time when you knocked down the door, the bad guys would pretty much give it up. And we've had now, recent times, I know this was, the last one was not your guys, but where they don't just surrender, they start shooting. Are we seeing a change in the way these guys are reacting to y'all's presence in your electric? You know, I, 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 it would be on an anecdotal, and I, and I don't want to just get into that. Uh, you know, I don't want to speculate. There's suspects that when you, when you say a police, they get on the ground. And there's suspects that could care less who it is, they're going to shoot at you. And in this case, the suspect decided to shoot, and then he came and uh, actually at one point took his gun out the door and shot at the officers as they were reportedly shot at the officers as they were making the, the, uh, the rescue. I'm going to do a little Spanish real quick because I know that some of them are live streaming. So, in Espanol, estamos muy agradecidos al hospital. Uh, como ustedes saben, ayer, <coughs> como a las 5 de la tarde, eh, nueve agentes de, 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 de la División de Nar, uh, narco, nar, nar, Narcóticos uh, fueron a hacer una, eh, eh, entrar a una casa, una orden de corte, y cuando abrieron la puerta, inmediatamente un perro bien grande atacó con unos oficiales y al mismo tiempo un sospechoso hombre que identifiqué ya eh, disparó a los oficiales. El primer oficial que entró con el shotgun Desgraciadamente, uno de los balazos le dio a él uh, y se cayó en, uh, en, uh, en, en un, uno de los muebles que estaba en, 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 en la escena. Eh, el momento que cayó, una, la sospechosa, la mujer blanca de 58 años de edad, fue y trató de acabar el rifle del oficial. Y cuando los oficiales vieron ello, eso, esa acción tomaron, dispararon para defender al oficial. El oficial que fue el que abrió la puerta eh, al empezar, vio que sus colegas, uno de sus colegas había estado balazado, entró y cuando entró también le metieron un balazo. Ese oficial tiene 54 años de edad, lleva 32 años en la policía y es un héroe, porque le digo que ese oficial, esta es la tercera vez en su carrera que ha, ha, ha tenido heridas de almas de fuego por sospechosos. Y entró porque sabía que su colega estaba, estaba en peligro y, qui, y quiso rescatarlo. Uh, y para mí habla sobre el corazón de nuestra comunidad, el corazón de nuestros oficiales, el coraje de nuestros oficiales y debemos de, de estar orgullosos. También quiero que sepa la comunidad hispana, latina, que está aquí, inmigratoria. Acuérdese que esa, ese, ese vecindario, ese, esa área... Eh, Casi todas las personas que vienen ahí, muchos de ellos son hispanos, son latinos, son inmigrantes. Y, y tengo orgullo de saber que tenemos una relación con nuestra comunidad que tienen confianza con el departamento policiaco. Con el departamento policiaco y, y reportar, porque sin reportar, el veneno que están vendiendo ahí sigue. Envenenando a nuestra juventud, envenenando a nuestros niños. Y queremos decirle a la comunidad especialmente la comunidad que es migratoria, que a nuestra documentada, gracias por su coraje, gracias por ser nuestro compañero y gracias por tener confianza con nosotros, porque sin los ojos y la cooperación de esa comunidad, uh, no podemos hacer lo que hacemos. ¿Ok? Gracias, que no me que habían comentado que los sospechosos eran de origen hispano. ¿Esa situación cambió? Ahora, que habían mencionado su identidad como hispano. ¿Quién dijo? ¿Nosotros? ¿No? ¿Oíste? No, 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 I don't know who did that, but I didn't, I, you don't need ninguna información sobre los sospechosos ayer. Pero que, no, que, no, que encontramos eh, marihuana, encontramos otra droga que pensamos que es o cocaína o fentanyl, no sabemos clase de droga, y, y encontramos varias armas de fuego, rifles largos y también revólveres. No, I'm not going to say I'm going to say those of us. We believe the only people left in the property uh, inside the home were the two deceased suspects. We heard that inside the home it was a huge mess. Can you talk a little bit about why the two robots were used yesterday to help through the scene? Once, once you have five officers down, it, uh, you know, uh, we always talk about time is on our side. We don't need, the last thing we needed was to, to uh, 
hurry, hurry up. And, and, and quite frankly, we don't know that anybody else is in there. We had some information there might be a, a handicapped person living in the uh, uh, home. That turned out that that person was not there if they even lived in the first place. But the robots were used, two different robots were inserted into the location to help clear the location, to help try to uh, find other suspects, and most importantly, to provide our tactical team, our SWAT team, uh, a, uh, a, a, a view of what's going on so then they can put together an operational plan to go in, know where the threats are, where people might be hiding, uh, and eventually we're able to clear the house and uh, HFD declared the two suspects, the 58-year-old uh, and the 59-year-old, uh, deceased inside the house. So. And just to clarify, Chief. Los oficiales, gracias a Dios, tenemos un oficial que tuvo un tiro aquí en el hombro que ayer lo soltaron. Otro oficial que tuvo eh, una en su rodilla, que no fue un balazo, pero tuvieron que operarlo. Está aquí todavía, pero está en una condición. Operaron, hoy lo operaron esta mañana, pensamos que va a salir esta semana. Y tenemos otro oficial, el oficial de, de 54 años, que es un león, ¿no? es un tigre, es una persona que, tienen, que es un héroe. Eh, él va a estar aquí por, por un tiempecito, pero con el favor de Dios va a estar bien. Eh, tenemos el otro oficial, el sargento que le metieron eh, un, 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 herida en la cara eh, a, 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 y él va a estar bien, gracias a Dios. Y tenemos otro oficial que tengo que respetar la familia, pero quiero que sepa la comunidad, aunque está estable, está en condición crítica y, y por favor le suplicamos que las oraciones para nuestros oficiales, no solamente los que fueron heridos, pero también las familias, los familiares, los familiares, los líderes, porque esto es algo que... Eh, causa eh, emoción para todo el mundo, nuestra familia entera de la policía de Houston. Al fin del día, estos sospechosos tienen, su, tienen familiares que lo aman y también nuestros mensajes están con los familiares de los sospechosos. Anything else? Chief, just to clarify, last night you mentioned black tar heroin. Today it's uh, marijuana and other yeah, drugs. Yeah, we actually bought black tar heroin uh, at that location. So there was heroin bought there at one point. Is this part of a large operation? We didn't find any of that. I just want to know, but John okay, Davis let me, is in the let hospital. Me, let me just go over here real quick. Just to be clear, of, of the five officers who got conditions on the four, is, is it fair to say that you feel confident about the conditions of the four that you released information on, but you're still very much concerned about the long-term well-being of that fifth officer? Do you feel like the four... I, 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 we're very concerned about one, and his, uh, while he's stable, we just ask for prayers. He's uh, he uh, he's in a really tough fight, and uh, uh, we we are hopefully he'll be surviving. But we, we we want a good quality of life for our officers, and, and our prayer would be that that we lift him up in prayer and his family up in prayer that that we can have a recovery, so he can have a, a, a fulfilling life that God put him on the earth. Uh, but stay. They're, they're stay with you. Chief, last time we heard from the union representative rather passionately, yeah. and he's gotten a lot of attention everywhere around the nation, talking about that you guys are sick and tired of being the target. Uh, do you share that? Because, you know, people on, on the general public think, obviously, this is incredibly tragic, yeah. but they weren't necessarily targeted or ambushed. Um, so maybe the conversation is going this way when it's. Yeah, know, look, hey, look, uh, you know, I, I understand that passion. I, I understand. Uh, his his passion, his compassion. You know these 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 people. Uh, I mean, and women, we really are a family. But that's a, that's a slogan a lot of places. But we really are a, a family. <clears throat> Let me just say this: um, we are being shot on a regular basis. If you look at the officer fatalities this year, uh, from gunfire, they're up. I would say that I would express my my personal frustration at lawmakers that know that we have a public health epidemic in this country that we call gun violence. We, we know that uh, that for whatever reason, they offer a lot of prayers. But you know what? We don't need prayers from, uh, we, didn't, we didn't elect people to pray for us. We elect people to lead us. We elect people to make public policy decisions not based on whatever their primary, uh, the, the, the politics of primary politics, right? Because only the basis basically and sooner or later, we will reach a point in our country where we're going to say we're not doing enough about gun violence. And so to the elected officials, I appreciate your prayers, but quite frankly, 
uh, we've got a convenient place for us. Everybody can pray, but the only one <coughs> that can uh, listen to trauma docs, I'm not going to talk about doc, but there's a reason that the Major City Chiefs Association has put forth a very a policy paper that talks about some of the steps that Congress can take. They have a national approach to addressing the scourge of gun violence. It doesn't just impact law enforcement, it impacts, it crushes communities, tears apart families, cuts life short every single day. For everyone that you and the national media cover, there are dozens a day that don't even get a mention. And so my response to me is, let's, criminals are going to be criminals, evil people are going to be evil. The question is, what are policymakers willing to do besides prayers to address a public health epidemic? And of course, somebody will now tweet, oh, there he goes, and with this, uh, it's not an anti-gun agenda, it's an anti uh, a proliferation of firearms in the hands of people that have no business having guns. It's a, it's an anti being able to walk to a gun show and I'm a private seller. I can sell my M and P long rifle with 20 clips to whoever wants to pay without a background check. There are things that we can do that are not being done, and I would say that our frustration should be with people that are elected to make a difference in policy, and instead they all went off with prayer. Uh, the other thing I will say from my perspective is this. If, you know, because we're at an era in our country where everybody, you know, we want criminal justice reform, right? We want to give people second chances. But when people are, involving, are involved in violent crime and they're, and they're committing felonious assaults with firearms, we need to hold these people accountable. And secondly, and we're, doing, and we're talking to the legislature now, we need to hold these felons and these gang members that, that, that the first thing they do when they get out of prison is go get their GAP. And I don't mean a group, group activity ticket, I mean a firearm. They're not carrying it with them just to show off. They're carrying it with them so the second some other gangster gives them the wrong look or disrespects them or they see an, a target of opportunity or someone that they know that did a hit on them two years ago, we've got to, we've got to, when we catch felons with firearms, what they are telling us is that they're not going to play by society's rules and we need to hold those, those offenders accountable. So that's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, because crooks are going to be crooks. The question is, what are we in society and what are elected officials going to do to help make it tough on those crooks to victimize? I'm going to just take two more and then we'll get out of here. Can you talk about the value of that? You said you offer what that means. Is that the hey, hey, hey guys, you know what? Hey, our, our number one force multiplies is the community. I mean, I want you to think about the Houston Police Department, 640 square miles with 5,200 officers. That's it. 20 years ago, we had 500,000 fewer residents, but 300 more cops. That's not a very good ratio. Our ratio is going down instead of up. And so the thing that we rely on here in the city of Houston is an outstanding police department. It's not perfect, but it's second to none. And most importantly, we work very diligently to build relationships with the community we serve. Without them, without their trust, I mean, this is in the east side that we knew after that uh, uh, SB4, the Sanctuary City debate a couple, uh, about a year and a half ago, we saw reporting of certain crimes go down, and our, our reporters that are here locally know that we put a very extensive and ongoing effort going into those communities, letting them know that we're the Houston Police Department, these immigrant communities, when we have 600,000 undocumented immigrants, let them know, hey, we don't, we don't care about your immigration status. We care if, if you're just here working, we're not ICE. Because we rely on them. They're witnesses, right? They're complainants, and we rely on them. And I think thanks to those efforts, those outreach efforts in Spanish and in other languages, uh, our community trusts us. And I may just say this to those that don't think we should be doing that. Uh, the person that's selling fentanyl to the immigrant community today is selling it to the blue-blooded, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, community members tomorrow, and guess what? The life that may be saved one of your life, loved ones, when people come forward and trust us to take action. They are our greatest force multiplier, and, and we, love our, we love our city, and if you talk to any cop in the city, they love the city they work for. I mean, they love this, I've never seen, this is my third police department, I've never seen a, a love affair between a city and a police department like we have here in Houston. It's a special place. And I think it starts with the tone that Mayor Turner sets as a welcoming city. 
and it ends with the tone that the officers in the street set with their community. So one more and then we'll go. Mira, sabemos que aquí tenemos una, una epidemia eh, de salud sobre toda la violencia con las armas de fuego en este país y como le dije a esta reportera aquí que eh, eh, yo me enojo no con sospechoso porque el criminal es el criminal, yo me enojo con los políticos que eh, no queremos sus oraciones, queremos acción, queremos que tomen acción para tratar de ser ley, pasar leyes para asegurar que las armas de fuego están en las manos de miembros de nuestra comunidad que son responsables y que no son criminales y que también tienen la salud mental, eh, que es buena salud mental y no están medio locos. Así que eh, la, la negación continúa, pero eh, sabemos que sin la cooperación de la comunidad, esta casa vendiendo drogas estuviera aquí ahora mismo también vendiendo de veneno a nuestros niños. Okay? So, is that it, guys? Thank well, you very much.